Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome. Hope uh, you all are managing to navigate the icy death trap that is campus at the moment. I walked out of my front door this morning and immediately discovered that uh, the entire area between the front door and the sidewalk was a solid sheet of ice. Uh, exciting times. Any questions on uh, the text generation lab or uh, hashing, maps, anything we've been looking at? All right, so today we'll be launching into a, a, a new topic that we'll uh, spend a number of days looking at, uh, a new kind of data structure. Uh, it was teased in a, in a table that I put up uh, when I was introducing how we might implement a map. There was something called a balanced tree. Uh, and so we're going to be talking about trees uh, for the next several classes. Uh, but before we, we launch into something new, I want to make sure that we're all uh, feeling good with uh, all the hashing stuff and, and when we would want to use uh, uh, hash tables uh, that we've been talking about. So uh, we'll start with some practice on that. First, a bit of review. Uh, why does it matter that a hash function uh, consistently or reliably give us different integers uh, for different keys? All right, uh, I agree with the majority here. Uh, uh, someone share how you're thinking about how our, our hash function is, is used to, uh, or, or um, like why it would be bad to have our hash function uh, reliably not return different ints. Yeah, exactly. We'd send everything to the same slot in our hash table, and we'd end up with some other data, uh, data structure that wouldn't have that sort of constant time uh, performance. Uh, for answer D here, If our hash function was just random, I mean, that's probably going to be different. Why would this not be a good idea? Peter? Random, you guys could not find out that if you were checking again or hashing it again, you wouldn't have the same result each time, so you wouldn't know where it was. Exactly. That we rely on the fact that if we put a key into our table, we can find it where we put it at some later time. But if our hash function was giving us a different random thing each time, uh, it would actually completely destroy it. It wouldn't just be bad performance, it just would not have the expected behavior. You would put a key in there and then say, is that key contained? And it would most likely be false because you'd get a different random int. Does that make sense? Questions on that? All right, so let's think about an operation on hash tables that we haven't talked about. What if we wanted to implement, say, a find min method that's going to find and return the minimum key? This is assuming our keys are comparable. So let's say our keys are integers, and we have some keys in our, in our hash table, uh, and the keys are, uh, are stored in, our, in an array like we've been talking about. Um, if we were to need to find the minimum one, think about what uh, what the efficiency of that would be. Uh, movement towards C. I agree that that's uh, what what this uh, find min is going to the amount of work is going to take, and uh, 
uh, someone who, who I want to share your thinking about why it would be a uh, big O of N? Liam? Well, it has to go through uh, every key, which is N, to compare every key to find out which one's the small one. Yeah, exactly. That if I instead had said, find the minimum element in an unsorted array, then uh, I think that it's clear that to find the minimum of some unsorted array, we have to check each element, because each element could be the minimum. And this is to illustrate that our hash table is not keeping our keys in any particular order. It's just sticking them in whatever index uh, the hash function uh, uh, indicates. And so we essentially, when it comes to finding a minimum or maximum or putting them in any sort of order, what we're dealing with is an unsorted array. So our hash table is, is great at uh, associating a key with a value, at, at check getting that value back out, checking if a key is in there, but anything about the order of the keys, we're no better than an unsorted array when we're dealing with a hash table. That makes sense, Jeffrey. I'm still kind of confused on um, like how using a hash table and a hash function would give the hash map the big O efficiency or constant. Uh, for how would it, how would we give a uh, constant time for what operation? For um, for finding the key is in the hash map course. So if we have like it contains operation. Given some key, we want to say true or false, that key is in our, our hash table. Our first step is to compute the index where we would expect to find this key. Uh, and so we can think of that as so our index equals, to make this a little Java-like, key.hashcode mod our table size. So we've kind of found our index. And then uh, the next step is to compare our key to whatever element is at that index. If we have separate chaining, we compare it to each element in whatever linked list is there. Uh, if we're using that probing strategy, we might have to check a few elements. But uh, at this point, we can determine whether the key is in the hash table. And so applying this hash function mod table size, this is a constant time operation, does not depend on how many things are in our hash table. And similarly, looking at the element at a particular index of an array, because it's important that we're using an array uh, to, to store our, our key value pairs, checking the element in the index of an array, that is a constant time operation. And so every, uh, uh, every one of our map operations kind of has a compute index, do something at that index, uh, and that's it. And all of them will be constant time because the kind of those two steps are constant. Other questions? All right. So uh, one one question that's come up a, co a couple times is about the final exam in this course. Uh, it will be a, a take-home final exam, it will be online, so it will be available the last day of class, and then you'll have as much time uh, as you need to, to work on it, and it will be due at the end of exams. Uh, this final exam will focus entirely on what I think is the most important uh, thing that I want you to learn in this course, which is given some situation, what data structure would you choose? What operations of that data structure would you 
uh, make use of and why uh, would you make those choices? So there won't be any Java coding on this final exam. It will be all about applying our knowledge of data structures. So uh, this is why uh, we have uh, um, uh, have been doing uh, occasional kind of practice with this uh, 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 task of given some scenario, what data structure would you choose? Elena? Will there be stuff on big O? Sorry? Will there be stuff on big O in the final? Will there be stuff on big O in the final? Sorry? So, uh, I, uh, uh, I will put out a study guide for the, the, the final later on, but uh, you will need to use your knowledge of how different data structures, what they're good at and what they're not at, which brings in big O, but it's not like you'll have a chunk, you'll be given code and be asked to, to analyze it. Anyway, so uh, you're writing a program to tabulate the votes for the president of uh, the very cool uh, Carlton Abstract Types Club, or the Cool Cats. Uh, which data structure uh, would you use to store the vote totals? Uh, and I've put in parentheses kind of the, the built-in Java uh, version of each of these kind of uh, a, an extensible array linked list and hash table kind of have their Java specific names. Uh, so movement toward a, a hash table, uh, that's what I would choose in this situation. Uh, can someone, someone share why, why you would choose a, a hash table in this situation? Exactly. When we're thinking about vote totals, we probably want a candidate and their associated vote. And when we have two pieces of data that we need to associate, uh, hash table is, is great at that. Uh, questions or, or comments? Yeah. Like if a question like this were to be on the final, would it be more detailed as in how it's storing it? And like if it wants to store like the name and the numbers, or if it just wants the numbers, or uh, so as in uh, like the exam question will not be multiple choice, yeah. and so any details that are not specified would be things that you would write down as part of your answer. Like, I am assuming these facts about this situation, and because only under these assumptions would I make the choice I'm explaining. Uh, yeah, so it will be important. Uh, and again, the study guide will, will cover this. Um, but to, to state any assumptions that you're making. Other questions? Paul? Yeah, for hash tables, I know we kind of talked about computing keys without their associated values. So when you have a hash map, will you only compute one of the two kind of values for the key, and then have the other values kind of hang around, or how does that work? Uh, exactly. That we're always going to be applying our hash function to the keys, and then the values kind of come along with the ride uh, for a ride. So you can you can think of our, our list map had a linked list of, of these associations that had kind of a key and a value inside them. You can think of the hash tables having an array of associations, where kind of each slot has this key value pair. Uh, and then for like a put operation, we're given the key and the value separately. We hash the key to figure out what index, and then we put an association with the key and the value at that index. Yeah, but for thinking about how hash tables work, we're focused on the keys because the value is just sort of hanging out, as you say. Staying with this theme, anyone who visits our Cool Cats website can bring up a list of notable Cool Cats from the past. Uh, if you're designing this, this website, you need some data structure to store the names that are going to show up in this list of, uh, of uh, famous cool cats uh, and what would you use to store those names? All right, so majority thinking B, uh, if 
clickers would let me mark two answers correct, I would have done so. Uh, so I would consider both an extensible array and a linked list, both given this information, I think both are reasonable choices. Uh, I might lean toward uh, the extensible array um, for the random access property. So if I need to like jump to some particular, like if I have extra information about each one in this array list, I want to jump to a particular one, but there is nothing in this that necessarily suggests that's how this website works. Um, other uh, thoughts why uh, extensible array or linked list or any questions? All right, I have one last one. <coughs> We're writing a program to count the times various keywords appear in a document. We want to store the results of this sort of keyword count. All right, so um, movement toward D, I think, which uh, would be a good choice here. Uh, can someone share your thinking about why you would use a, a hash table? Cam? Well, it's pretty similar to the Frankenstein example from last class, right, where you have your keywords, which would be the key, and this time it would be like the object version of the string, right? And then you have your value, which would just be uh, the amount of times that keyword appears. Exactly. We, we have a keyword and a number of times. We want those two to go together. Map's a great choice for that. All right, any questions on any of these kind of data structure? Uh, choice questions. All right, so uh, time for trees, but before trees, we need uh, Benjamin Harrison. Uh, Grover Cleveland, talked about last time, first Democratic president since the Civil War, uh, ran for re-election, won the popular vote, got the most votes, uh, but lost to the Republican Harrison uh, in the Electoral College. Uh, the vote was still very, uh, like, geographically uh, 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 segregated uh, between the, t the, the two parties. Uh, and to me, at least, uh, Harrison is perhaps the, the least memorable of the, the U.S. presidents. Um, but uh, he... Uh, there were some interesting things he was involved in during his term. He uh, uh, pushed for uh, 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 civil rights uh, in the South, though that was uh, not particularly successful. Um, he uh, tried to uh, reform um, the, and kind of reduce corruption in, in, in the government, uh, passed a, a massive increase in, in the tariff, the kind of tax on, on imported goods, which was kind of favored by, by uh, factory owners and, and industrial workers. Uh, but one of the, the main criticisms was this big tariff uh, and other taxes raised lots of money, and so the government was also spending lots of money, uh, and his, his critics really did not approve of, of this uh, dumping money down the, the billion dollarism hole. Um, so Harrison uh, would actually be uh, replaced with a, a familiar face. So we'll, we'll, we'll uh, uh, see a familiar face next time. Uh, but the last fact about Harrison, he's actually, the, I believe, the grandson of a previous president, William Henry Harrison, who you may remember served all of three weeks in, in office before uh, uh, dying of, of an intestinal ailment. So his, his grandson certainly had him, has him beat uh, on, on that count. Uh, all right, so trees. What are trees? Trees show up in all sorts of things, uh, in all sorts of contexts. So one kind of uh, tree you might have seen before is uh, one showing how different species are related to each other. Um, If you think of a kind of organizational chart for a company, uh, we can think of this as sort of a, a kind of tree where there's uh, something at the top and kind of branches below that. Uh, uh, you've probably heard the term family tree. 
so you can kind of show uh, uh, lineage through through a family tree. Uh, the files on your computer are arranged in uh, what turns out to be a, a kind of tree structure with uh, the different folders having folders underneath them and kind of branching into into different places. Uh, there's also a notion in computer science called a game tree, where we think of different ways a game could go as being represented by a tree. So we have a tic-tac-toe board, and the X player may make a move in different, in different locations. I'm only showing three of the possible moves here, but like given one of those moves, then the O player could make some other set of moves, and so we can kind of make a tree of all the possible ways that some game could go based on all the different, different moves. Uh, we can even arrange uh, uh, arithmetic expressions uh, in a tree form. Um, anyone have a guess as to what, uh, like if I were to write out this arithmetic expression in this tree here, what, what that would be? Marcus? It would be like parentheses 5 plus 9 and parentheses um, times 2 and then plus 3. Yes, exactly. How, how did you get to that? Um, I kind of, I started from the end because I just looked at the multiplication symbol and the addition sign and that's what made more sense to me. Yeah, that we have each of our arithmetic operators has below it kind of the two things that go into that operation. So we have a plus with five and nine below it, and then a times with two, and that five plus nine below it, and then a plus with a three and all the rest below it. Um, and so we can actually see uh, uh, these arithmetic expressions as having this sort of tree structure. We also have the larch. It's very nice, but not a kind of tree uh, that we'll, we'll be talking about in this class. Uh, all right, so let's, uh, let's make this a bit more formal. Where what do we call all the different parts of our tree? I'm going to put our arithmetic expression up here. And one term is is parent. So we'd say this plus is the parent of the five and nine uh, parts of the tree. One of these kind of elements of our tree is called a node. Uh, the same idea as our kind of link list node. We had this kind of this chain of, of objects. Now we have, have nodes arranged in a kind of more uh, uh, complex structure. Uh, and if plus is the parent of 5 and 9, uh, it stands to reason that 5 and 9 are children of our plus node. So we often talk about, uh, uh, this is kind of informed by the fact that uh, we use trees to kind of represent uh, like a, a family with kind of parents and children and siblings and ancestors and descendants and kind of all those terms gets, get applied to describe relationships between nodes in a tree. 
And so five and nine would be siblings. This multiplication would be an ancestor of five and nine, it's kind of somewhere higher up in the tree than its immediate parent. And kind of all of these uh, nodes below, multiplication would be its descendants, its two direct children, uh, and then ones further down. Making sense so far? The node at the very top of the tree is called the root. Uh, this is a little upside down. We often think of roots as forming, you know, the base of a tree. We're talking about the larch. Its roots would be at the bottom. In computer science, a tree's root is at the top. It's kind of the, the node from which kind of everything descends. Um, and uh, the unique thing about the root of a tree is it has no parent. It's the only node in the tree that doesn't have a parent. Every other node is connected uh, uh, to some parent above it. So we have kind of this uh, uh, family uh, 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 language, parent, child, sibling, and so forth. Then we have our, our uh, kind of biological terminology, our root of the tree, and all nodes that don't have any children are called leaf nodes. Uh, form the bottom edge of our tree. And three would also be included as a, as a leaf node as it also has no children. Uh, and that leaves our two nodes in the middle here called interior nodes. They're not the root, they're not the leaves, they're in the middle. Two other terms I want to, uh, to mention. Uh, depth and height. These are kind of two properties of, of nodes. Depth the depth of a node is its kind of distance from the root. So the depth of the, um, our root would be zero. The depth of three and multiplication would each be one. The depth of plus and two would be two. And the depth of our five and nine down here would be three. Now, distance down the tree from the root is our depth. Height is sort of the uh, other idea, uh, going the other direction. And we say that the height of a node is the distance of its longest path to a leaf. So it's basically saying the height of a node is kind of how deep does the tree go below that node? So to give an example, kind of the numbers I've written on the left of each of these nodes are the depth. I'll then write the height on the right side of each node. Uh, what, given this definition of long, the distance of the longest path to a leaf, what would the height of our, our root node here be? I mean, 
Exactly. We can trace a path of one, two, three down to the leaf that's farthest away. How about this node, this three over here? What would its depth be? Or sorry, what would its what would, what would its height be? Serving one. Yeah. So I think in this case uh, we would say that our leaf nodes have height. Uh, zero. There's kind of no edges. There's no, like the, uh, as long as path. We're kind of counting the edges in between uh, as the length of this path. So this three here would have uh, no path to a leaf. It's already a leaf. So that means that. Uh, all our all our leaves here would all have a height of zero. How about our uh, multiplication? What would its height be? Yeah. Two. Yep, it would be two because we can go one, two down to a leaf, and that means our plus here would have a height of one. What are your questions on this? Is it making sense? All right. So we have a, a tree like uh, like the one here. Uh, it is a particular kind of tree. called a binary tree. And a binary tree is either an empty tree with no nodes at all, just nothing, or A root node that has kind of left and right subtrees and these left and right subtrees are also binary trees. So we can kind of think of this definition uh, visually. as we have a root node, and then coming off the root node, we have our left and our right subtree. And these left and right subtrees are exactly this kind of recursively, where this left subtree is either nothing or it's a root that itself could have one, zero, one, or two children. Peter. So it could have just one child. It doesn't have to have both left and right subtrees. It could only have one. Uh, that's exactly right, because our left and right subtrees are themselves binary trees, which includes them being an empty tree with no nodes. Yeah, so this subtree kind of uh, applies this, this same definition. Other questions? Elena. Wait, so if the rule only were to connect to one node, what would that uh, That would be a uh, one of many possible binary trees. Because our, uh, we could have something that was just the root. Uh, we could have something that was just the root and a left child. And its right child is a binary tree that's empty. 
uh, we could have one that was a root and just a right child, one with both children, and kind of uh, any of these kind of possible structures combined could kind of form a binary tree of, of arbitrary size. Please. Um, so I've heard more than two children. Uh, for, it's a good question, do our trees ever have more than two children? Uh, trees in general, yes, can have any number of children. A binary tree is specifically one that has up to two children. Jeffrey. So if at the root node there's two children, and then each subtree can have more than three children, would the entire tree not be considered a binary tree? Uh, that's correct. That, uh, a binary tree is one in which every node in the tree follows this definition. Every spot in the tree is either empty or a node that could have up to two children. Let's see. So would you use a binary tree like if you're trying to keep two different types of data separate? Yes, yeah, so great question. What would we use a binary tree for? Uh, one use of a binary tree is representing an arithmetic expression like this. Uh, and this is actually how, under the hood, Java represents code, including arithmetic expressions. Uh, so Java takes the kind of text that you have typed in and internally turns it into this kind of uh, tree because that makes it easy to like go to any point in this tree and say kind of compute what the result of this plus is. And once I have that, I can compute what the result of this multiplication is. So these sort of binary trees are, uh, are, are used inside kind of compilers uh, to represent code. Elena. Um, so I can't have like three That's right. That would be a tree, but just not a binary tree. Other questions? All right. So let's uh, take a look at uh, what we would see to make a binary tree. Um, in uh, uh, in code, all right. Make this be Java. Uh, so we might make a class that's a binary tree node, hold some uh, something of type of uh, some placeholder type that I'll call E. this. There we go. Uh, and uh, I would say uh, it would have um, uh, some uh, uh, data stored at each node. Uh, and then it would have, uh, and I'm making these, these public because it will make it easier to, to do stuff with this tree, but you could make them private and define kind of method like get get data, get left, get right. Um, but we'll have another binary tree node that is kind of coming off the left of this node, and a binary tree node that's coming off the right. Uh, and if I wanted to make a constructor for this, uh, I'm going to say binary tree node uh, takes in some data, uh, takes in a left, takes in a right. I right, put these on separate lines to make them fit, which is something that Java is just fine with. Uh, and then I might say this.data equals data, this.left equals left, this.right equals right. <coughs> So I have my uh, binary tree node class has its left and right children, which could be null to indicate that there is no child there. That's our kind of empty tree. 
uh, uh, and some data stored at each node. Any questions on this? Make sense? So, an interesting thing that we might uh, try and do with a, a binary tree that, say, representing one of these uh, arithmetic expressions uh, is we might say, okay, let's make a uh, uh, method called evaluate that can take in a binary tree node uh, that has strings inside it uh, and that's some arithmetic expression. And let's imagine for a moment that my that this expr tree uh, is just this plus here that has five and nine uh, on either side of it. And I want to return the result of actually you know doing this plus. Uh, so I might say um, like uh, I'd say switch on um, uh, the data in this tree, and there'll be a case where uh, it's a plus inside the tree. Uh, and so how would I get the result of doing that plus? How would I, how, how would I write the code to get what that number would be? Here? If we're assuming both the left and the right are integers, then we can just add the two, or add the left and the right tree. Exactly. That I can get to the five by saying dot left of my plus node. I can get the, the number inside of this node, the five. I can get it with dot data. And I can then add that to the right dot data. Uh, and that would be my, my kind of result, so I could return, return that. And I could kind of make one of these cases for uh, subtraction, for multiplication, and for division. I wanted to kind of cover these four, uh, four different arithmetic operators. So, unfortunately, this approach makes this, uh, this particular assumption. What, what am I assuming here? Luke? That the left and the right um, trees don't contain another expression. They're like addition subtraction. Right. That I'm, uh, I'm assuming that I have kind of uh, uh, integers uh, on the left uh, and the right. Um, uh, and, like, if I was dealing with this multiplication node, that's clearly not true. Uh, but this is where uh, recursion can really help us out when we're dealing with trees. Because if I have a method that can take in a tree and give me sort of the... Um, uh, give me the kind of number that that, that part of the tree uh, computes. I can say, okay, the result of the left is call this evaluate method on the left subtree. And the result of the right side is I can just call evaluate on the right side. And now these all just become the result of the left and the result of the right. So now if I'm at the multiplication, I say take this left tree, evaluate it. Take this right subtree, evaluate that. And then once I get both of those results back, then I just multiply them. What's this recursive function missing? Yeah, there is, there is no base case. Uh, 
in uh, uh, in this tree, what distinguishes uh, the, our nodes with kind of numbers and our nodes with uh, some operator? Uh, they are children. Yes, and our our number nodes here are the leaf nodes. They have no children, and so. Uh, uh, I might write a kind of is leaf function return uh, left is null and right is null. Like there are no children of a node. That makes it a leaf. So I might say if this expression is a leaf, then just return whatever string is inside the tree. It must be the string version of some integer, and I'll kind of turn that into an integer and return that. Uh, otherwise, I'll do this kind of recursive application of the tree. So we'll see lots of examples of how recursion can kind of let us kind of do fun things with trees. That's all we have time for today. Uh, keep working on text generation in Lab 5, and have a good weekend. I'll see you Monday.